As has been said a few times, we are beginning a new campaign. If it's one of your first times with us or you've not been with us for that long, what we try to do is uh, run our uh, church calendar sort of semi around uh, the school calendar. So sort of think in terms of, uh, in terms, of terms, uh, if that is uh, helpful for you to sort of structure your, your, or latch onto that structure. So we kind of do a, an autumn term, a spring term, and then a summer term, and then we have the summer where things are a bit different. Uh, this feels a little bit loud. Is it just me or is it okay? Um, so in the autumn, we, we do a campaign, which is where we spend some time together as uh, on Sundays as a church family and midweek in our explore groups, all looking at the same material, the same ideas, the same concepts, the same themes, uh, so that we're all growing together. And then at other points in the year, we do things where we gather around activities or events that people want to do, uh, like 5K or learning how to bake or uh, cook barbecued meat or something a bit more perhaps spiritual and learn how to pray or read your Bible more effectively, those sorts of things. Uh, and then at other times we just we gather and each group does something slightly different that's tailored to them. So uh, in this season, we're into a campaign. We're beginning it in earnest this morning. Uh, but one thing just to mention before that is if you are interested in ex exploring what it means to be a member of the church, then there is a lunch after the service today. I know most people who are coming to that have already booked into that, so that's fine. If you uh, haven't sort of said, oh, I want to be at that, it would be helpful if after the sermon you could talk to me about it because then we can make sure there's enough food. Uh, so that's just something to mention. And then explore groups. Alex highlighted it there. It is in this season particularly, it's so helpful if you can engage with an explore group. You know, realistically, it may not be every week, but if you can just at least be attached to a group, that's what we want for everyone, so that you can spend time with people every other week or once a month, just get involved with a group of people who are going to be able to encourage you and bless you as you grow and walk with Jesus. Uh, this morning is a moment. Obviously, all moments are moments, but this morning, uh, it feels like a moment for me. Uh, and I'm saying that, so because you don't always recognize moments when they happen, and you sort of look back and you think, oh, when, that, that, where, where did that start? I feel like this is a moment where something starts. It's the moment where we all got read books. <laughs> no, so these are, these are your campaign journal. And you should, should have a little pen with it as well. There are some at the back there. There's some more in the office. There's spare pens if your pen goes missing. Uh, you know, I'm not sure about you, but I know pens tend to go missing uh, when people are around. They borrow them and then maybe they forget to give them back or they think, oh, this is a nice pen and they deliberately forget to bring it back. But you've got a, a book and a pen. We were going to buy the... Uh, so we're, we're doing a course called Practicing the Way. And I've been told, obviously, you know, practicing, Americans don't have the right kind, they don't have the two types of practicing, they just have the one type. So please forgive us if it's uh, slightly branded wrong. But um, we, the, the campaign journals that come with this book, it's, it's quite a new course, so they're only printed in America. Uh, and so even at the discounted rate of buying in bulk, uh, they were going to be the most expensive book that we'd ever bought uh, for anyone at any point. Uh, in the church. So instead, what we've done, because the books were basically questions with then some lines underneath for you to write your answers, uh, you've got a book where you can write the question yourself and then write your answers. So that was much better, and it's got a nice little debossed logo on the front. Uh, even if you're not a note-taking person, you can still take one of these and a pen, and you might find yourself jotting down one or two thoughts. Uh, but the idea of these is that they are attention-grabbing. I don't imagine you have many other red books like this, so you will be able to find it easily amongst your stack of books on your bedside table after a few weeks that you'll be able to pull it out and then continue uh, writing in it. These are for everyone who is from Ignite Age upwards. Okay, so if you've got children, uh, then from Ignite Age upwards, they can have one of these. There's probably enough for some sparks to have one as well if your child has already started drawing in it or drawing on the front, uh, as my child has done. Um, but there are enough of them for that, re for that uh, demographic. So 
Don't worry about it if that has happened. But I do think this is a moment. I think if we engage with this material, if we get it, that this could really be something. This could really be a moment where things transform for us as individuals, for us as a church family, for the town of Watford, for the area of Croxley, and even beyond. I, um, I really believe that. I think I, I, I've, I've not been sleeping very well. I'm not sure why, no particular reason. But I wake up at one or two in the morning almost every night, and I'm awake for several hours, and then I need <laughs> to get back to sleep. And last night, I had my awake time in the middle of the night, and I just felt stirred by God. And I was praying for this morning, praying for this uh, series as I have been doing over the last few months. And I was reminded of uh, the Academy, which is the new ground like theology and leadership training program. Uh, and uh, when I did it, I was miserable. <laughs> um, I, I, some other people in the church were doing it. And so uh, Megan was doing it at the time. She'd done a year and had loved it. Had really like enjoyed it so much. And then uh, Andy had done it as well. It was, okay, it's great. It's great. And so I then sort of my time came to sort of start doing it and I overlapped and I was miserable the whole time I did it. And uh, I was so frustrated by it the whole time. And every, I'm just being honest with you because we, you know, we want to be authentic and real, don't we? So this is, you spend the whole day listening to someone who is a fantastic teacher, someone who's living out the gospel and they inputting into you saying, here's some, here's some great information, here's some great stuff. And I was frustrated and irritated and irritable the whole time. And if I'm honest, I probably ruined the second year for Megan um, with my bad attitude. And I couldn't work out why. why. Why do I find this annoying being here? This should be fantastic. Listening to someone who is doing the business, saying, here's how you can follow God. And at one point on the academy, you have to write yourself a letter. You know, one of those exercises where you write yourself a letter and then they post it to you. And all I wrote on mine, I was thinking, I don't know what, I, I'm frustrated. And I wrote on it, make disciples. Like you, what do you want to be? tell yourself in a year's time? And so I just wrote, oh, make disciples. Because that's, that's, and when I went on my sabbatical last year, I was looking at some, some uh, material and spending some time learning from people. Make disciples. Make disciples. I'm 40 years old. I turned 40 years old this week. Uh, <laughs> I, don't really, I don't mention my birthday, but that I did turn 40 this week. Uh, I've been following Jesus for over 30 years. I've been an elder for 10 years. And uh, I've been full-time for the church. I've been working for the church slightly longer than that, but I've been full-time for the church for nine years. And... Uh, it's only, I think it's, it's, it's has just crystallized in my life. This is what it's about. Make disciples. I'm sorry to all of you that it took me that long. <laughs> but this is what it's about. This is what Jesus, his command to his disciples was go and make disciples. And so a lot of what we're going to look at over the next three months or so and beyond, which I'll talk about later, isn't new information. That was part of my frustration at the academy. I was thinking, I hear you and it's great. I know, I know. And my frustration was with myself was, I shouldn't be here learning. I should be going and doing. Now, that's not true for everyone at any time. But for me in that moment, that was my frustration. I realized after this, God, there was an un a dissatisfaction with me that, hang on, I'm, I'm, I, lo I know all of this already, not in an arrogant way, but I should be doing this, like going out and speaking to people, not just learning it again, learning it again, learning it again. So I think in Christian circles, there can be almost a temptation to go, okay, I'm going to learn more. I'm going to learn more. And it's great to learn. But we also need to do. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. So it's not in new information, uh, but for me, this is what I sort of, uh, my, uh, my adult, a slightly adult brain is, is like the difference between eating canned or tinned peaches. I don't know if you like tinned peaches. I like tinned peaches with a bit of evaporated milk on. I'm, I'm sort of, you know, old school, 
channeling my inner boomer or whatever you want to say. Um, but it's, for me, it was like I, I, when this sort of dawned on me, this sort of just some stuff, a realization happened that it was like I'd been eating tinned peaches and someone said, this is a peach. And it was a fresh, ripe peach and I bit into it and it was juicy. It was good. It's like, ah, oh, I like tinned peaches, but fresh peaches are the real, the real stuff. So I don't know if that's helpful for you, but kind of the information that we're going to be getting, it might not be new to you, but hopefully it's fresh to you. So not, it might not be a, a new thing, but it might, hopefully it will be fresh. So we're going to be doing this uh, series of practicing the way. I'm excited about it. That's all of that that I've just said. I'm excited. That's what I'm trying to say to you. I'm excited about what this might mean for us as a church. And so last week, I kind of did a little teaser preview, and we looked at Mary and Martha and the parable of the sower very briefly. And Jesus' correction to, to Martha was that she was concerned or anxious about many things. I think most, most people we know, most people you know, lots of people in their lives today are concerned and anxious about many things. And for me, I know, I said this last week, it's easy to allow the things of life to come in and choke what God is trying to do. We looked at this verse from John 10. The thief comes to steal, only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And Jesus extends an invitation to us to follow him, to learn from him, to become unburdened and receive and live an abundant life or life to the full. We said that's not living at breakneck speed and burning out and exhausting ourselves, but that's living in the way of Jesus that we might experience life to the full as it was intended. So how do we do that? And that's what we're going to be looking at. So as we uh, go through this series, this is a kind of uh, idea in a sentence, I suppose, uh, or a run-on sentence, as I like to, to write. Uh, it says this, Apprentices of Jesus are formed uh, to be like Jesus over time by learning from Jesus, adopting the practices of Jesus, and imitating his way of life in community through the power of the Spirit. I'm going to read that again, because that's the idea of this whole thing, uh, really. So I want to read it again. Apprentices of Jesus are formed to be like Jesus over time, by learning from Jesus, adopting the, adopting the practices of Jesus, imitating his way of life in community through the power of the Spirit. And so you're likely going to hear some of this stuff. There'll be lots of overlap of these ideas over the next couple of months, but the idea is that they layer on top of each other and build and build and build, and they become integrated into our life. And you're going to hear some of this information in your Explore group, so I'm going to kind of just do a pocket version of this, but I just want to do two minutes maybe on it. Uh, so that we kind of get the idea, because it's a foundational thing. So, as I said, in Explore Groups, this will be explained a bit more. But kind of in Jewish education, there were three levels. There was the kind of, everyone got this sort of initial education, learned some stuff, and we looked at this before, and Andy was talking about Jesus calling us to follow him uh, in our Matthew series. Uh, you get this sort of, everyone gets the basics. Then if you were really good, if you showed some aptitude, if you were, you know, one of the clever ones, you got to go to the next level. And you got some more training, you got a bit more input, you got to study a bit more with someone who was paid to be a teacher. Uh, and then if you were really good there, if you were like the best of the best, you got into the next level. And then if you were sort of the best of the best of the best of the best, you might have someone who was a rabbi, a teacher, who would come to you and say, I've noticed you, I want to talk to you. And they'd interview you. They'd ask you some questions. What do you think about this? What's your view on that? And then they'd say, yep, you can follow me. And oh, if someone invited you to follow them, what a privilege. There's a, it gets mentioned, I think, a few times. Uh, a, an old blessing was to be, you know, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. You're so close that as they're walking along, the dust from their feet kicks up onto you because you're living in that close proximity to them. Jesus was often called rabbi. I think it's helpful for us to think rabbi, not teacher. Teaching is a wonderful profession. We've got many teachers uh, in the church. 
modern teaching, our kind of teaching tends to be a bit more, I'm at the front of the class. Please, teachers, I know you do a lot more than this. I'm at the front of the class. I'm giving you information. You're taking down this information. Great. I'm seeing my next 30 people in, t in half an hour or whatever it may be. Same thing again. We tend to sort of think, okay, I'm going to learn from this person, make some notes. Okay, I've got everything I need. Learning from a rabbi, being a disciple or a Talmud, uh, was Talmud, whatever, I can't remember the exact pronunciation. The idea was that you were an apprentice. That's perhaps a better word rather than disciple. An apprentice of your teacher, of your rabbi. So you don't just learn what they knew, their head knowledge, but imagine if you were a teacher, you're teaching at the front of a class, and the class starts to imitate you. They copy your mannerisms. That's more what we're talking about. If you were following a rabbi, you would want to, like, you'd pick up their patterns of speech, you'd pick up their sort of way of even perhaps moving and talking about things. You would want to be shaped to become like them. Imitate their teachings, but also adopt their patterns of life, mannerisms, turns of phrase. And ultimately, eventually, your aim was to become a rabbi yourself, who would then in turn train others. The life of an apprentice of Jesus is centered around these three goals. Be with Jesus. Become like Jesus. Do what Jesus did. Be with Jesus. The primary way this happens is through the encountering the presence of God through the Holy Spirit as we read the word, as we pray. Become like Jesus. Be spiritually formed by Jesus, by the Spirit, to look like him. And then do what he did. Go and make disciples. Teaching them to do the same. Jesus was a rabbi and he calls us to follow him, whoever we are. Not just the best of the best. That's the joy of it. Even I get to be involved. Not just the best of the best. Whoever we are. And he's very real about what this looks like. Jesus isn't doesn't think, okay, I've called you to follow me. Now you're going to be absolutely perfect from day one. Jesus is real about this. So we need to be real about it as well. This is your permission from one of your elders to not put on a good face. To not, when you turn up to Explore Group, and we've been perhaps looking at spend, you know, spending time praying, trying to make in prayer a daily habit. If you didn't pray every day that week, you have permission to say, do you know what? I just, I don't know what happened, but on Tuesday, I just didn't pray. I was too busy. I'm not sure what went on, but you have permission to say that. And everyone else will probably go, oh, yeah, it can, it can be busy sometimes, can't it? How can we make our lives better, routined around this? That's what we're looking at. Jesus was real about us following him. He outlined the, what it looks like to live in his kingdom. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, James preached on this a, a while ago. Uh, from our, so when He preached on this particular section at the end, which is good, go and listen to it. But there's a particular phrase at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which is, the Sermon on the Mount is kind of collection. If you imagine Jesus did like a week's teaching, you know, festival, you know, a Christian camp, if you've ever been to one of those. And it was all collated then into the, the Sermon on the Mount, the highlights of that teaching. Uh, but this, this is kind of where it ends. Uh, and if you read the Sermon on the Mount, it's, it's, it's very real. It ex expects us to fail, expects us to fall, but it's still a high bar to achieve. It ends with the story of the wise and foolish builder where Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He doesn't say, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and thinks, yeah, Jesus, you've got some really cool ideas. I really, I really like what you said about that. I think that's very interesting to think about. Or I agree with you. I think that's, yep, you're right, you've got it. Everyone who puts them into practice. Everyone who acts on them or does them. So over the next few months and beyond, we're going to learn how to put them into practice, how to 
act on Jesus' word. So this morning, what I want to do is just drop two principles in that will help us to do that in a sustainable and authentic way. And then I will sort of try and give a little bit of an overview of how this is going to work for potentially the next two years and beyond. So don't panic, okay? I'm not, you know, you're not signing up for anything for two years, but uh, I would explain a bit more of that later. But principle number one is this. It's about training, not trying, progress, not perfection. To live like Jesus takes a lifetime of practice in community. It's not about trying really hard for a short period of time, failing, and then trying really hard again. It's about cultivating. That will happen. Just let's all be real about that. It will happen. You will try your very best, and you will probably not succeed but you will then try again. That's, that will happen. But that's not what it's about. It's about, can you go from step one to step two? And from step two to step three. Can you cultivate a life and a lifestyle that means that, oh, if I look back six months ago, I, I couldn't pray for more than two minutes twice a week. And now, six months on, I can pray for five minutes every day. It's about cultivating a lifestyle that is conducive to those things. I'm shocking in the garden. I, you know, I'll just cut whatever. It's, it's dead <laughs> if I get hold of it. Megan's great. She's, I'm going to put this here. I'm going to put that there. I've got a lovely wisteria growing. I've got this other stuff. I don't know what it is, but it looks good. Um, but we need to think. Like a gardener, like a, a sort of more, I'm going to cult, I'm going to plant this and see, I'm going to let it grow. I'm going to put this in the ground. And at, at this time of year, that's going to be flowering. And at this time of year, that's going to come up. Allow ourselves time. Okay, I'm going to just keep doing this. I know it's, the seed's in the ground, the water goes on, something's going on in there. Oh, now there's a flower or you know, some beans or whatever. <laughs> I said I don't know the difference. <laughs> if you start running, I, you know, I used, to, I got to a point where I really loved running, and I was, you know, I wasn't very good at all. But I, was, I made a new friend recently. Millie started playing football, and the assistant coach, I coached the team, and the assistant coach, he's a runner. He's training for his next marathon. I think he's done five or six of them, something like that. Um, but he's sort of saying, "Oh yeah, I'm going. I, I went out for a run the other night." And I, you know, I was doing 30k or whatever he was doing. And I was like, oh yeah, I, I you know, I'm building myself back up as well. I did four. <laughs> um, but it, you know, if I said to him, come on, let's go for a run, and I, and he said, yeah, okay, and I tried to do 30 kilometers with him, I'd be in bits the next day if I ever made it. I mean, I wouldn't make it. I'd, I'd, I would be in bits halfway round if I made it that far. But maybe at five, maybe I'd get to 5k because I was with someone else. At six, I'd be like, oh, John, we need to stop. I, so, oh, yeah. It just doesn't work. You can't do it. You can't go from zero to running a marathon. You have to start a little, do a little bit. Okay, next week, okay, going to add another kilometer on. Okay, do that for two weeks. Okay, next week, I'll add a little bit more on. And you build yourself up. You progress slowly. I know there's people who are actual serious <laughs> serious runners in the room. So um, don't judge me too harshly for my building back up. Um, but it's about progressing, not perfection. No one is expecting everyone to turn up next week, week one, and go, hey, we all smashed it. Our prayer, our reading, every day, morning and night, bossed it. That is just not realistic. It's not going to happen. Many of us will never, ever get there anyway, even with a whole lifetime. I am employed full-time by the church. Some days, I, some days I do get days like that. I've spent all of this time in the presence of God just praying, reading my Bible, great. Other times, 
It's like, I, I wish I had those days again where I had two hours to do that. There's other stuff that needs doing. The New Testament is uh, serious about this and real about this as well. It says this, the Apostle Paul writing says, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. That's not me. Um, <laughs> I think that's off the Nike website. No copyright infringement intended. Um, and when, again, Paul writes to Timothy. He says this to, to Timothy, what someone who he's trained. He says, uh, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Where it says man of God there, it doesn't mean just men. Man of God is like, you know, the man of God's come in, the one who's like got the message from God. It's saying the people, the messengers of God, the followers of Jesus, even if you're the one who's got the message and you're bringing it, you need teaching, reproving, correction, and training. You need all of those things. Even if you're the guy or the girl, the one who's got the, hey, I'm coming in to bring the message today. Andy and I need those things. And so we need to be in Scripture, being shaped by it. So this is the point. It's about try, a training, not trying, progress, not perfection. Life is messy and inconsistent, and we're looking for upward trends, not instant success. So let me encourage you to try and spot the grace of God in your life, not your failings. And the same for other people. Where is God at work, not where are you failing? Okay, this, that's principle one. Principle two is this. Abiding requires active engagement. Jesus said this in John 15. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Abiding requires active engagement. It's a quote from Augustine, it says this, Without God, we can't. Without us, he won't. You will not wake up tomorrow morning and a lightning bolt from heaven strike you and you levitate out of your bed at 6.30, hover down to the, wherever it is that you have your prayer time and be praying without any kind of effort for yourself. If you want to get up early and pray, you will need to set your alarm or have something going on in your life that means that you don't sleep very well for no good reason, and you wake up in the middle of the night, which is fun. <laughs> Liz is laughing. We, uh, we've, got that, we've got that shared experience, Liz. Remember, it's about training, not trying, but it does require effort. Training requires effort. If you're training and it's not taxing you in any way, you will not be progressing. Training is only easy if you don't want to improve. And our effort should be directed towards abiding. It requires active engagement. Being connected to Jesus. Being aware of his presence. Being engaged with the Holy Spirit and aware of what he's doing. This morning, there was just like a moment as we were singing that last song, uh, How Great Thou Art. As a bit, I was, I was standing there, I was holding Joseph's head I don't know, I was just holding his head. And then we, then we sang the verse uh, about giving his only son, giving his son, should not spare. And I just thought, oh my goodness, it just hit me again in a new way. Just, oh. And I could, you could feel in the room the spirit just, whoosh. oh yeah, thank you. How great thou art. I went into football mode. <laughs> I don't know. You, Probably couldn't hear because I was near the front, but I was like, yeah, how great thou art, come on. Um, 
we have to engage in that. If you come on a Sunday morning and you sat at the back, and so, you know, some people, people engage in different ways, so hear what I'm saying. And you sit at the back and you don't sing any of the songs, don't even look up, don't even read the words, got some earplugs in, don't talk to anyone, don't even look at anyone. You know, you've got your blinkers on, earplugs, sensory deprivation helmet, whatever. If you just came and sat there, you're not engaging. By actively engaging, we can encounter together. Abiding requires active engagement in every situation. I think this is a Dallas Willard quote, which <laughs> over the series, you will hear lots of those from the guy who wrote the, the book, John Mark Gomer. Uh, grace is not opposed, it, it, grace is, sorry, let me start again. Grace is opposed to earning, not effort. Your effort does not win you God's favor. God's favor is won for you already. The verse prior to uh, the ones we just read from John uh, 15 says, you are already clean, so abide in me. You're already clean, so put in the effort to abide in me. We're not talking about earning God's favor through forgiveness or doing the right things. We're talking about living life to the full. So if we want to be with Jesus, if we want to become like Jesus, if we want to do what Jesus did, it's going to take some work and effort on our part. It's not just going to happen like that. Please, God, there will be moments of transformation. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> not sure everyone heard that. Um, there will be moments of transformation. I know people who, when they, you know, addicted to pornography, get saved, never an issue again, swear like a trooper, get saved, never again, can't break a you know, smoking habit, encounter with God, completely set free. Those moments of transformation happen, but they happen in the context of we're trying to abide. So, there's some recommended resources. There's loads of stuff. I started sort of going, oh, I could recommend this. This is the first one that I'm going to recommend, and we'll collate a list and maybe send it around at some point. But this is well worth getting. This is the book that this campaign is set, uh, based off of. So you, if you want to hear the information via book, as well as from me and Andy and from Midway Group, it's called Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do as he did. Uh, so I would recommend that. It's well worth getting, well worth reading. I, I have to take information in several times over to, for it to stick, as, as Megan will tell you. Um, but I don't want to bombard you with loads of uh, recommended stuff, but that and Andrew Murray's The True Vine, uh, good. It's only a pound or something on Amazon. But we're going to build slow and sustainable. We're not going to, this is not going to be a rush. Uh, when we talked before about extraordinary prayer, I don't know if you remember that. Take what you're doing now, add one thing, one little aspect of prayer, and suddenly you've got extraordinary prayer because there's extra to what you're ordinary doing. This is what's going to look like. We are currently in the big red oval uh, and what we're going to be doing we're going to spend a few, uh, the next few months looking at building some foundations in and then over the next sort of few years we're going to learn some of the practices the sort of the habits the spiritual disciplines the means of spiritual formation that Jesus did uh, so things like sabbath prayer fasting solitude generosity being in scripture, being part of community, serving, witnessing. That's not an exhaustive list, but that, that's, that's what we're going to begin to look at. Uh, in these blue, and just, this is just representative. We, we haven't sort of settled the dates yet, so don't start writing this in your, your actual diary. But in these blue moments, we're going to just spend four weeks looking at what it means to Sabbath. 
we'll pause whatever we're doing. We're, we're going, you know, we've been going through a series in Matthew. We're going to go back to that in the new year. But at some point, we'll, we'll just pause that and go, hey, do you remember we spent four weeks looking at Sabbath at the end of, you know, that's what we're going to do at the end of this year. Okay, now we're going to spend four weeks looking at fasting and how we can integrate that into our lives. We've done spiritual disciplines before as a series. You know, week one, we're going to talk about prayer. Week two, we're reading the Bible. Week three, fasting. Week four, Sabbath. And, you know, by the time week six rolls around, you're just thinking, oh, I've got all of this new stuff to do and I can't fit it all in. So we're just going to do it slowly. We're just going to take our time, really invest. Okay, let's, let's dig up some space in the garden and plant something. And this is, you know, let's, okay, let's get a little Sabbath plant going. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Okay, next season, let's, let's get a little fasting going. Let's get a bit of prayer going. So we will introduce some of these things over the next uh, three months, but then we're going to spend four weeks at the end, so the next two months, and then we're going to spend four weeks at the end really sort of focusing in, and then we will do that again at different points over the next few years. Too much at once means it can't, you can't really adopt it. You can't really allow it to shape your life or reshape your life. So we're going to spend a bit more time. Jesus has earned your salvation. He's paved the way for you to experience life to the full. He's inviting you to become his apprentice, to learn how to live like him. Apprentices of Jesus are formed to be like Jesus over time by learning from Jesus, adopting his way of life, imitating his way of life, doing that in community and through the power of the Spirit. Jesus was a rabbi and he invites you to apprentice under him. He's not Lord Sugar. He won't fire you for a bad performance. He's not that kind of apprentice. His heart is for progress, not perfection, as you train in the way of righteousness, actively engaging and abiding with him. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you invite us. Whether we would qualify as the best of the best of the best of the best, or whether we would not even cope in the bottom set, Lord, you invite us to follow you and be your apprentices. Thank you, Lord, that you have earned our salvation, that we're not doing this to be pleasing in your sight, but we're doing this because you've invited us in and it's a privilege to get to labor alongside you in your kingdom. It's a privilege to live kingdom life to the full. So Lord, help us to see as you see that we are seeking to be transformed from one degree of glory to another, that we want to progress. We know that perfection comes when you come again. But for now, we want to progress. We want to be trained by you. Lord, help us to abide, to draw our strength from the true vine, to recognize that <clears throat> apart from you, we can do nothing. If we're doing it in our own strength, so let us draw, help us to draw nourishment and strength and sustenance from you, Lord, through the Spirit and through your word and through prayer, that we might bear much fruit in this world. 